I'd like to welcome everybody to today's presentation on the pharmacology of alcohol. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. Now, this presentation is designed for clinicians who work with people uh, in mental health, substance abuse, and even physical health settings. There are a lot of licensed clinical social workers, for example, who may be working in uh, hospitals or diabetes care or long-term care facilities, and they may be also facing issues related to the impact of alcohol. Even if it's not alcohol misuse, the impact of alcohol on the body. So we're going to explore a lot of that. We'll explore the impact of alcohol on neurotransmitters and major bodily systems and discuss how physiological changes as a result of alcohol use impact each piece of life. Alcohol impacts the body. We know this. We drink it and it triggers the release of all kinds of hormones and neurotransmitters that can help us temporarily feel more relaxed, feel better. But that's not all that it does. It actually impacts every piece of our life, physically, interpersonally, emotionally, cognitively, environmentally, and for some, spiritually. And, and we want to recognize, again, that the acute impact is, or the really acute impact is physiological, but it helps people feel more confident sometimes. It helps them feel more sociable sometimes. Uh, sometimes if they're using, uh, if they drink alcohol, maybe they get a little buzzed, they may forget to do things that they had promised they would do. So it may negatively impact interpersonal interactions. Um, emotionally, when we start messing with those neurotransmitters, it's going to affect our emotions. Cognitively, people don't think as clearly when they are intoxicated. And environmentally, if people are regularly using and regularly experiencing inflammation and reduced immunity from use, then it may contribute to problems at work, which may lead to job instability, financial instability, and housing instability. So just looking very superficially at the way alcohol impacts each piece of life, you can see that it does have wide reaching impacts. It's also important to recognize that alcohol affects different people differently. Partly, one of the factors is due to your body composition. Some people who are larger or, you know, may be able to tolerate more alcohol before they start feeling buzzed than other people. But also age. People who are younger and their brain is, is more malleable, has not finished developing yet. They are more susceptible to neurotoxic damage from alcohol use. And people who are older are more susceptible to inflammatory side effects like liver inflammation and other problems as a result of alcohol use. Their body, as we age, our, our body does not process toxins as quickly. The liver starts getting tired. And when that happens, it means that alcohol and the toxic byproducts can build up in our system. And that can be cause more toxicity in someone who is older. So just these things I kind of want to throw out there at the beginning so you can be thinking about them as we're talking. I also want you to think about the people that you see. And maybe even, you know, your friends and family and all those things. How many of those people drink regularly? And maybe it's a glass of wine. Maybe it's a bottle of wine. I don't know. Maybe it's a beer. Maybe it's a six pack. But just thinking about the frequency and the intensity with which people around you are drinking and with with which your clients are drinking is important. I'm not saying it's necessarily a problem. I'm not saying they necessarily have alcohol addiction. What I am saying is that the alcohol use could be negatively contributing, negatively compounding the other issues that they've got going on that are contributing to whatever reason they're seeing you. According to the 
Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2015 through 2020. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and U.S. Department of Agriculture. Moderate drinking is one per day for women and up to two drinks per day for men. And we've talked about this before. One drink of wine is only a few ounces of wine. It's not much. A lot of people, most people that I know that drink wine, when they drink wine, it's two or three drinks, as we quantify it here, at least per day. And that's on a pretty regular basis. It's kind of what they do when they get home um, or what they do after dinner, whatever. Raising awareness of this can be important because we can help people see how the alcohol in the short term may help them feel more relaxed, but in the long term starts contributing to other problems. So what does alcohol actually do? Alcohol upreg upregulates GABA. We all know GABA as our natural volume, if you will. It's our most prevalent, most prominent uh, relaxation neurotransmitter that we have. So it turns that up, which is good, which is why when you start drinking, you people often report feeling a lot calmer, a lot less inhibited. They're a lot less tense about what they're going to say. And if it's the right thing to say, they just, they're like, eh, whatever. <laughs> That's part of the gap. <laughs> but <clears throat> the body responds to this hyper sedation by upregulating glutamate, our main stress hormone. Now think about how cool that is. Okay. Our body recognizes that we're too relaxed. We're out of balance for what we're, our normal is, whatever your particular bodily normal is. The body recognizes that and says, oh, we need to balance it out. So it turns up the glutamate. Thinking about a bath, you know, you're running your bath and if you start getting it too warm um, or actually too cool, then uh, you naturally say, oh, this is getting too cool for what I like. I need to turn more hot water up to keep it balanced in a way that works for me. Okay. So the body responds to the hypersedation by upreg upregulating glutamate, major stress hormone. All right. What happens then? When the alcohol wears off, the person feels anxiety symptoms because of the excess glutamate. The alcohol wears off before the body can rebalance itself. So now it's got too much glutamate and the person feels anxious. When they feel anxious, they either reach for another drink or eventually it goes away and their body rebalances that GABA glutamate, le those levels. But it takes a minute, which is why a lot of people respond to that initial wearing off of the alcohol. I hate to call it detoxification because people think of something else, but that initial exit of the alcohol from the system puts it in another state of imbalance, which is the anxiety, which leads to continued use. Long-term use of alcohol leads to an increase in glutamatergic receptors in the hippocampus. Long-term use of alcohol causes your brain to increase the number of receptors for glutamate. It says, okay, you're regularly hyper sedating me. So I need to have extra crew around to respond and keep the balance going. So it actually makes you more sensitive to glutamate. Oh gosh, now we're more sensitive to glutamate. So when the GABA starts to wear off, not only do we feel anxious, now we feel even more anxious when it wears off. The low to moderate levels of alcohol increase dopamine release, but high levels, interestingly enough, actually dampen it. Dopamine is the, I want to do that again, neurochemical. And it's also involved in processing. And uh, when dopamine is released, a lot of times um, opioids, your endogenous opioids, your endorphins are also released. That's your feel-good chemicals. But when you get too high, the body recognizes we're out of balance. We're out of balance. This is toxic. This is too much, too, too sedating. And so the body says, hey, we're not going to send out the dopamine anymore because we don't want you to continue drinking or you're going to die. Um, and 
my body always responds with a southern accent, so just forgive me. Chronic ethanol exposure produces adaptations in the dopamine release. What used to be high levels are now moderate. So when people used to start drinking, they'd have high levels of dopamine release and they'd have that euphoria. Now the body says, no, we're not going to go there. We're not going to get hyper sedated. This is not a good thing. So when people drink, they don't get that same endorphin and dopamine rush that they were getting. Chronic ethanol exposure also produces adaptations in the opioid system. And we're going to talk more about that later. But one of the takeaways is when you've got somebody who is on opioids, whether it's an acute administration after an injury or a chronic administration for some reason, uh, we need to recognize that alcohol and opioids are additive and exponential. So one plus one is three, or the psychiatrist I used to work under said five. One plus one is five. Um, because they are both, alcohol and opioids are both activating those mu opioid receptors. So we're getting this hyper uh, stimulation of the opioid receptors, which we know are system depressants. We know that when people are um, using opioids, that if they use too much in the way of opioids, their breathing will stop or slow. And that causes a whole other set of symptoms. Well, the same thing is true. If they're combining alcohol and opioids, they don't need to use as much opioids if they're combining it with alcohol to actually cause those deadly side effects. Just paying attention. Alcohol increases serotonin receptor activation, which can potentiate your SSRIs. If you've got a person who's drinking alcohol, maybe to self-medicate, it does temporarily increase the activation of serotonin, which may be what they're working on or, you know, going for. However, uh, if they are taking SSRIs, first generation, second generation, third generation, it doesn't matter. If they're taking something that naturally increases, and herbs like um, SAMe, um, if they're taking those, then alcohol is actually going to increase the intensity of the impact of those medications. And it can become too much. People who drink when they are on high levels of uh, SSRIs, whether pharmacological SSRIs or herb-based, you know, prescription or over-the-counter, doesn't matter. If they're already increasing their serotonin activation, then they drink, again, one plus one is five, and they can potentially lead to uh, serotonin syndrome, which is deadly. The fever, uh, their body gets really hot, tremors, vomiting, um, need to get to the uh, ER really quickly. And as I said, al alcohol activate. wow, try that again. Alcohol activates mu opioid receptors, which are the same receptors activated by opioids. And again, that is, can be extremely dangerous. Uh, physical effects of alcohol. Heavy drinking worsens morbidity or problems from chronic disease as it increases inflammation in the system. So let's think about it. I'm drinking alcohol. What is alcohol? Alcohol is a toxin. What's our immune system supposed to do? Help us get rid of toxins and bad things and our livers and our kidneys and everything else. So I'm drinking a toxin in order to produce an effect. That is going to irritate the stomach lining. That's going to irritate the microbiome and the system and lead to increased inflammation, not only in the GI tract, but also in the liver, potentially in the brain. It's going to increase hypertension. Alcohol detox is nothing to play with. If, especially if somebody is tolerant, has alcohol tolerance and they actually have to detox from it. I'm not talking about the person who has two drinks on a Saturday night, probably not going to throw their blood pressure way up unless they're already hypertensive. If they're already hypertensive, then any amount of alcohol can 
significantly increase their blood pressure when it gets to that point. Remember, initially there's the relaxation and then as the alcohol wears off, the glutamate stays high in the system and that's when the blood pressure goes up. People who are detoxing, who are heavy chronic users of alcohol who detox or people who have pre-existing hypertension when they are sobering up uh, are at risk of a hypertensive crisis or a stroke. They need to be aware of this. Obviously, if we're talking about adults, they're going to make their own choices, but they need to be, I would say, hypersensitive to the fact that if I'm going to drink, I need to be very careful about how much I drink because it could uh, have significant negative impacts. People who have diabetes, and I mentioned that at the beginning, there are a lot of people who have diabetes who still occasionally drink. All right. You know, my, my grandfather has diabetes. He still occasionally has a ginormous slice of cake. He's 93. He's able to make decisions on his own. But when we drink, we cause inflammation. That stresses the body out and activates the stress response. When we activate the stress response, the body starts dumping blood glucose uh, in order to give us the energy to fight or flee. So when we drink, we actually increase the, um, our, our blood sugar in response to the threat from the toxin. And then when the alcohol leaves our system and that glutamate is too high, that stress response get tr gets triggered again. And guess what? It releases more blood sugar. So the HPA axis, the stress response system gets activated at ingestion and at sobering up, you know, both sides of it. So you have a bimodal activation of the HPA axis and a bimodal increase in the, in blood sugar. That's really important for people to understand. And then hepatitis. Itis generally means inflammation. Hepa, in this case, means liver. We're not talking about filters here. Um, hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. The liver is supposed to help get rid of toxins. And when you're bombarding the liver with uh, toxins, it can start to experience inflammation. Heavy drinking also interferes with the metabolism and therapeutic action of various nutrients and medications. Now, I found this really interesting. This is in the update. It wasn't in the class that I did a few years ago. Alcohol is metabolized by my favorite, cytochrome P450, which is a family of enzymes that help break down substances in our body, especially toxins. Now, Alcohol is specifically broken down by CYP2E1. You don't need to remember that for the test. That's, it's not that important. But it's one of the family members of the P450 family. What's interesting is then you go and you look and you say, what other things are metabolized by CYP2E1? And you find out that other sedatives like opioids... Um, and your benzodiazepines and your barbiturates. And uh, those are all metabolized by CYP2E1. So when somebody's drinking, the, the alcohol is competing with those other substances for that enzyme to get cleared from the body. So one of them is going to build up while the other one is getting excreted. Uh, and that can be extremely problematic. And it depends on a lot of different factors, which gets excreted first. Most of the time, alcohol is dominant and takes over the CYP2E1. So the other things kind of get left to the wayside. But it also impacts the body's ability to process procarcinogens in the body. Uh, when, it, when the body gets a carcinogen in it, specifically in this case, tobacco smoke, related carcinogens, CYP2E1 is responsible for breaking those down and getting rid of them. But if somebody's drinking, then those carcinogens are going to hang out for a little while longer and while the alcohol is excreted, 
which is why there's such a correlation, or if you will, between health problems in people who both drink and smoke because it's a double whammy, which I thought was interesting. Explains a lot about my family too, by the way. They were all heavy smokers and drinkers, so, <laughs> but more than you needed to know. The impacts of alcohol on nutrition are important. Remember, nutrition is what we eat, and what we eat is broken down into the building blocks to repair our tissues, to make the neurotransmitters, to make the hormones, to help keep our body factory functioning. So if we can't, if we're not getting the nutrients we need, either we're not ingesting them or not absorbing them, then we're going to start having systemic problems, physically, inflammation, pain, sleep problems, emotionally, cognitively, we're going to start seeing those issues. So alcohol causes increased inflammation and damage to the GI lining from alcohol use. And if you've ever consumed one of the stronger alcohols, uh, like vodka or grain alcohol, you know, it, it's, it kind of burns when it goes down. And that's just kind of exemplifying how irritating that substance is to our very delicate um, line, lining of our GI tract. When it finally gets down into the gut, all the little gut microbes go, ah, uh, remember gut microbes are microbes. Microbes are little living organisms. And if you are bathing them in toxins, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to kill some of them off and probably not the ones you want killed off. There's a reduced ability of the body because of the inflammation, because of the altered gut microbiome, the body loses or reduces its ability to absorb folate, thiamine, B6, B12, vitamin A, D, iron, E, omega-3s, folic acid, zinc, choline, iron, copper, selenium, and even proteins. Okay, so just about anything that you are ingesting is probably not being absorbed very well when you are also consuming alcohol. Now, does that mean what I eat with dinner, if I'm having a glass of wine with dinner, that impacts it? Yes. But we also have to recognize that as long as that inflammation lasts, we're going to have impaired nutrient absorption. So if you go out on a Friday night and you have some drinks and you irritate that lining, it may be Sunday or Monday before that inflammation has gone down and things have kind of restabilized, which means you've got three days of poor nutrient absorption. Liver damage also occurs. The liver plays a central role in nutrient metabolism, including storing vitamins like A and B12. B12, most people think of as their energy vitamin. If they're feeling low on energy, they get, met, get assessed by their doctor and some people will go get a B12 shot or something. Now you can have too much B12, okay? You can have too much B12, but in people who have liver damage, they often don't have enough and it's hard for them to maintain their B12 levels and their vitamin A levels if the liver is not able to store it effectively. And the liver also produces proteins necessary for nutrient transport. So if the liver's shutting down, then some of these nutrients, even if they are like available, they may not be able to be transported to the departments in your body factory that they need to go to. All of this, in addition to the stimulation of the uh, dop dopaminergic system, from the acute administration of alcohol, all of this can lead to altered neurotransmitter levels. Your body's not able to effectively produce neurotransmitters. Your gut microbiome is out of balance and it's calling for the production of stress-related uh, neuro neurotransmitters and, and components. So we start to see the body system switching gears to accommodate this alcohol influx. Heavy alcohol use impairs liver functioning, which can cause toxicity and systemic inflammation, which we know, remember, systemic inflammation, it's not just my liver's inflamed, it's everywhere, including your brain, 
everything starts to get inflamed. We know that's associated with increased levels of depression. So al heavy alcohol use is associated with systemic inflammation, which leads to disproportionate loss of cerebral white matter and impairments in cognitive and in executive functioning. Again, white matter, gray matter, we don't need to get into a lot of detail about that because that's not important as important for treating people, but recognizing that we start to see shrinkage in the brain. We start losing neurons. <laughs> it's just no other way to say it. Postmortem studies showed that about 75% of heavy drinkers have significant brain damage and degeneration. It can be somewhat rectified over time, and, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Again, recognizing in your patients what's causing their impairments in cognitive and in executive functioning. Executive functioning, remember, is your concentration, attention, planning, problem solving, learning. Um, if people suddenly start having problems with this, we want to get curious. They don't just suddenly develop ADHD, all right? Uh, so we want to get curious. It could be a myriad of things. We don't want to just jump to the worst possible conclusion. Alcohol abuse and thiamine deficiency together cause greater reductions in white matter volume. So if somebody is drinking, using alcohol, and they're not getting enough thiamine in their diet or it's not getting absorbed well enough, then it causes greater stress, greater neurotoxicity, and greater reductions in white matter volume. Strategies designed to reverse thiamine deficiency will not fully restore cognitive and behavioral functioning. There are a lot of things we need to do. Restoring thiamine deficiency is really important because that can lead to, if we don't, that can lead to Wiernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Regarding gray matter degeneration, thiamine deficiency alone reduces neurotransmitter levels in the hippocampus and the cerebral cortex. These are places where we don't want neurotransmitters reduced. This impacts all brain functions, processing and interpreting of information, controlling thoughts and memories, so people may have more intrusive thoughts, more um, spiraling thoughts, regulating emotions and feelings, managing sensory input, and coordinating muscle movement. When people are intoxicated, we know they have difficulty with balance and coordination. Well, we start to see that become more permanent as instead of the gray ma matter being essentially asleep, um, we start seeing the gray matter degenerate. It, we're losing it. Cognitive impairment in humans can be partially reversed by abstinence, but more than 50% of people have persistent alcohol-related deficits in learning, memory, and executive functioning. With adequate therapy and addressing the underlying issues that are contributing to HPA axis dysfunction and stress, a lot of people are able to regain a lot of their functioning. I know of people who haven't been able to regain at all. I'm not going to say that it's 100% improvement is always possible. It's not. But if we target the specific symptoms and recognize that, yes, alcohol may have contributed to the development of these problems, but what else is continuing to impair learning, memory, and executive functioning? My guess is we can trace it back to something that is causing stress, which is causing dysregulation in the autonomic nervous system, which is keeping the environment in the brain neurotoxic. And I know you may have to sit down and chart that out because I'm a visual learner, so I would need to see that. But we want to get to the root cause. As therapists, we can help people identify what's contributing to their symptoms, what they can do to try to address their symptoms, what they can do to mitigate the impact of those symptoms. If you have perpetual memory deficits, okay, well, that sucks. What can we do to help you live your rich and meaningful life and still have these memory deficits, which may not go away? We do the same thing with people after they have a stroke. You know, 
They may never get back to 100%, but we want to help them live their rich and meaningful life. So we want to identify what other things haven't been addressed yet or could be addressed that could help you improve the symptoms in these areas. Alcohol-related cognitive impairment can persist after detox and can be difficult to diagnose as well as differentiate from other neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. You need to refer to a neurologist. It's always better to be safe than sorry if somebody is experiencing uh, cognitive impairment after alcohol use, especially after heavy alcohol use, it's always better to refer out because there are different treatments for each one of these things. And there are medications that are coming out now that have been shown to slow the progress of some types of dementia. We don't want to just assume that it was due to alcohol. Maybe the alcohol was secondary. They had the dementia all along and they started self-medicating and we don't want to misdiagnose. Alcohol-related inflammation and physiological changes can also worsen neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, because that inflammation activates, if you will, the processes that contribute to those things. Just like alcohol contributes to loss of brain cells, neurodegeneration in the brain, it can also contribute to the specific neurodegenerative disease symptoms. Hepatic encephalopathy. I used to love to say encephalopathy because it reminded me of Mr. Snuffleupagus. But again, (laughs) you know, just one of those random tangents. You got to go on with me. Hepatic encephalopathy means dysfunction of the brain as a result of something going on with the liver. It's clinically manifested by personality changes, confusion, difficulty thinking, sleepiness, sometimes coma, tremors, loss of fine motor coordination, hyperreflexia, slowed speech, and mild cognitive impairment. So for somebody with acute hepatic encephalopathy, we might think to ourselves, are they drunk? They're acting drunk. What's going on with them? Uh, Individuals with acute hepatic encephalopathy may have deficits in ability to work and capacity to carry out activities of daily living. It's important to remember that hepatic encephalopathy is not only caused by alcohol-related inflammation. It can also be caused by a variety of viruses and other toxins. Again, don't assume refer out to a medical provider who can make an accurate diagnosis. Wernicke's encephalopathy is an acute disorder, so dysfunction of the brain, identified by some guy named Wernicke, is an acute disorder caused by thiamine deficiency. Symptoms include altered mental state, ataxia, and ophthalmoplegia. Um, I actually had a client who had ophthalmoplegia, has never have been able to say that. At one point, she came in. She was not a drinker. She was one who typically used crack cocaine, but she did present one day, and both of her eyes were rolled up, and she couldn't roll them back down. Her eyes, the, her eye muscles were paralyzed, and obviously, we referred her to a neurologist immediately. Repeated bouts of thiamine deficiency cause severe and permanent deficits in spatial memory and increased perseverative behavior. And that can continuation of something, even when you should have stopped it, or repeating the same thing, saying the same thing repeated, repeatedly, can be a sign of thiamine deficiency. Thiamine deficiency, again, can occur as a result of a variety of issues including alcohol abuse, alcohol misuse, anorexia, and gastric bypass. We've seen Wernicke's encephalopathy in all, all three groups of people. And the common denominator is a gross inadequacy of thiamine. 
Thiamine deficiency, together with binge or chronic alcohol exposures, causes progressive cognitive dysfunction and loss of neuroplasticity due to dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system caused by GABAergic inhibition and increased glutamatergic excitation, which basically means the flat to furious that we've talked about before. When the body is regularly exposed to stressors, the influx of toxins and then the imbalance when the toxins leave, so we've got two activations of the HPA axis, just like in uh, traumatic stress, we see alterations in the HPA axis. That's what we're talking about here because the body starts saying, we can't release this much GABA. The body starts adjusting to being overloaded by GABA by reducing the amount of GABA and the activation of those receptors and increasing the activation and availability of glutamate receptors. Expecting the body is going to be bombarded with alcohol and um, uh, the thiamine deficiency contributes to this. Korsakoff syndrome is characterized by confabulation, which some people mistake as lying. Confabulation is when somebody has gaps in their memory and they fill in the gaps. They're trying to make sense of it. They're not trying to lie. They just fill in the gaps with something that kind of makes sense. And it's not a conscious process. People don't intentionally go, I don't remember what happened. Let me just say this. Confabulation happens very naturally. So it's characterized by confabulation, memory loss, and gait abnormalities that are often irreversible and results if Wernicke's encephalopathy is not treated adequately. If somebody starts de displaying symptoms of Wernicke's encephalopathy, that's a medical emergency. That's a call the ambulance, get to the ER, and start the IV running. That big of a problem. Uh, so we need to be sensitive to that for whatever reason. Even if you're seeing somebody in mental health treatment, they don't use alcohol, but they had a gastric bypass some time ago, or they've um, been really sick. Maybe they've been throwing up a lot because of a virus they have for an extended period. Sometimes we will see uh, minor thiamine deficiencies in women who have really aggressive uh, morning sickness and postpartum. Uh, prepartum issues. And, uh, but since they're seeing the doctor so often, that often gets caught really early on. Whereas most of our patients that we see aren't going to the doctor every three weeks. If treated quickly, Korsakoff syndrome development may be prevented with thiamine treatments. Thiamine needs to be administered quickly and intravenously. This isn't something you say, well, go home and take some thiamine st supplements. No, 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 no. This is something that is a medical emergency. Heavy alcohol use is associated with circadian abnormalities, short sleep duration, obstructive sleep apnea, and sleep-related movement disorder. When people drink, it initially, it relaxes a lot of the muscles and can cause the, I think it's the uvula, to fall backwards, which exacerbates um, obstructive sleep apnea. And then tension in some of these muscles evidently also can exacerbate obstructive sleep apnea. So you may get to sleep faster, but the quality of sleep you're getting is crappy. Alcohol acts as a sedative that causes presynaptic release of GABA and interacts with several other neurotransmitter systems, particularly serotonin and glutamate, which are important in the regulation of sleep. Now, we keep talking about GABA and glutamate. Glutamate is your primary excitatory neurotransmitter, and it's actually broken down to make GABA, which is kind of cool. But uh, it's important to recognize that GABA and glutamate have to be balanced. And when we sleep, we need higher levels of GABA, lower levels of glutamate, higher levels of melatonin, lower levels of cortisol. Alcohol abuse and dependence are associated with a downregulation of the GABAergic systems following the development of alcohol dependence, which means when they're not using, they have increased anxiety. Chronic sleep disturbance and disrupted cortisol and melatonin rhythms 
are also seen. Well, we have a down regulation of our natural sleep promoting, relaxation promoting neurotransmitter system. So yeah, it's going to be harder to relax to get to sleep. It's going to be harder to stay to sleep, which is going to mess up our circadian rhythms, which means that normal awakening response where cortisol spikes and reduces throughout the day is going to be thrown off kilter. And if anxiety stays high most of the day because that GABAergic system is downregulated, then cortisol levels, instead of peaking in the morning and then gradually declining, they're going to peak in the morning and stay peaked, which is not what we need. In order for our body to release melatonin, that cortisol has to go down. Insufficient quality sleep or insomnia are associated with significant negative physiological consequences. Physically, the insufficient sleep or insomnia can cause dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, your stress response, stress and relaxation response, and circadian rhythms. It also impairs immune function and cardiovascular and cerebrovascular health. It contributes to inflammation, which causes problems in the cardiorespiratory system. Interpersonally, well, when somebody's not getting enough sleep for whatever reason, they have a lack of energy and a desire to engage with others. Emotionally, when they're not getting enough sleep, they're not motivated to engage with people, they don't feel like they can get done the things they need to get done, they're going to start feeling more guilty, more anxious that they're letting people down, more fearful of abandonment, more irritable because they just don't have any more bandwidth for other people. Um, and eventually will lead to a place where they're experiencing more emotional dysregulation. They're either flat, they just, they don't have it in them. They're just trying to put one foot in front of the other. And if they do get triggered, they're furious or frantic. Cognitively, insufficient sleep um, or insufficient quality sleep increases intrusive thoughts, hypervigilance to threats in the environment, and cognitive impairment. When we don't have enough sleep, it triggers the stress response. Our body says, okay, you're sleepy, you're vulnerable, so I'm going to give you more energy. You're welcome. And, which means that we are stressed, basically. And we know that when that stress response is activated, whether it's a little bit or a lot of bit, we're in fight or flight. When we're in fight or flight, it our energy is focused on survival, not thinking about it, not cognitive processes. It's focused on protecting ourselves and trying to get through the very next moment. Now, if it's activated a little bit, then we're going to have a little bit of cognitive impairment. If it's ex activated a lot, like if you're terrified, then you're not thinking at all. You're just trying to get the heck out of there. So it is a... Um, there are differences. There are different levels of cognitive impairment as a result of sleep disorders. And as I mentioned earlier, when all these things start going out of whack, then a person may get sick more, may have difficulty performing at the job, may have difficulty focusing, have more job accidents, which can cause job instability, financial instability, and housing instability, all of which cause more stress. In terms of the endocrine system, acute alcohol exposure activates the stress response, leading to a dose-related increase in circulating cortisol and causing threat-related responses, which is, as I said earlier, um, when people drink, it upregulates the GABA, but it also upregulates up cortisol, which we don't really feel until the GABA is leaving the system. Chronic use leads to a blunted HPA axis response and the inhibitory control of the HPA axis becoming impaired in, in heavy drinkers. So when people use chronically, instead of having a typical response to a stressor, reacting with a five to something that deserves a five, then they may react with a two to something that deserves a five because it's just, I don't have the energy. But then when they do get triggered by something, maybe it deserves a 7. They react with a 17. Chronic alcohol exposure causes a decrease in testosterone, 
progesterone, and oxytocin, and an increase in estrogen in both sexes, which is interesting. Increases in estrogen in females is associated with increased anxiety. So we see how these go together. We know that increases in serotonin are often associated with increases in anxiety, and alcohol increases serotonin. Decrease in testosterone, especially in men. But oxytocin is the interesting thing because oxytocin is our bonding hormone and our social engagement hormone. And chronic alcohol exposure actually reduces this where people just don't really have the desire to interact with others. It's not be necessarily because of experiences so much as part of their wiring, the, the neurotransmitter that makes us want to engage with others. There's less of it. And that can heal over time. But we do need to help people in recovery do things to actively try to stimulate oxytocin release. And hypothyroid. Chronic alcohol exposure negatively impacts thyroid hormones. And this is another really interesting thing that I found out in this update. In chronic heavy users, so a lot of people that you're seeing in re recovery and um, alcohol sub substance abuse treatment, their thyroid hormones may be about normal for the first 28 days. But then after 28 days, there's a precipitous decline for a lot of people in their thyroid hormones. And I didn't do a deep dive to figure out why, but I linked to the article. So if you want to go ahead and click on that and read the article, you can. But that's important for us. If you're working with somebody in recovery, maybe you're in residential, and you're working with them from day seven to day um, 38. You know, they're, towards the end of that, all of a sudden, they may, may start feeling more depressed, more exhausted, more listless. Well, let's get their hormones, let's get their thyroid hormones checked because they may be experiencing temporary hypothyroid. Alcohol-induced changes in the gut and intestinal microbiome contribute to the link between alcohol-induced oxidative stress, intestinal hyperpermeability, systemic inflammation, and organ damage that are including the development of alcoholic liver disease. The takeaway from that is alcohol-induced changes in the gut can cause leaky gut syndrome. Toxins leak into the bloodstream that aren't supposed to be there cause systemic inflammation and inflammation of the liver. Dysfunction of the gut microbiome, which is what they call gut dysbiosis, can be caused by diet, disruption of circadian rhythms, illness, stress, and or alcoholic beverage consumption. When people are stressed constantly, when they've got CPTSD, they're also at much greater risk of having leaky gut because of that gut dysbiosis. Alcohol suppresses the immune system, making people more susceptible to illnesses and inflammation. Alcohol causes inflammation, and we've talked about this in relation to the HPA axis before. But at a certain point, cortisol loses its ability to suppress inflammation, to, and the immune system starts losing its effectiveness. It's just getting tired, basically. Uh, so because it, the immune system is trying to deal with these constant breakdowns caused by alcohol, uh, then other pathogens kind of have a back door to get in. People get sick easier. Chronic alcohol exposure interferes with the normal functioning of all aspects of the adaptive immune response. Acute alcohol use inhibits so slows down, and chronic alcohol use accelerates the inflammatory process, partially due to activation and progressive problems with the stress response or the HPA axis. So as the HPA axis goes up, or as, as the HPA axis is activated, we see when it's healthy, we see a suppression of inflammation. But when the HPA axis gets unhealthy, because of addiction, because of trauma, because of stress, because of pain, whatever the reason, then the HPA axis loses its ability to um, suppress inflammation. Alcohol withdrawal symptoms begin two to 48 hours after you have your last drink. Depending, 
lar largely depending on how much you drank and in what period of time. Symptoms usually peak around 24 to 72 hours after you stop drinking. Now, this is especially true with somebody who is alcohol dependent. For somebody who drinks a little too much on Saturday, Sunday is going to be hard, but Monday should be better. So what we're looking at here really is somebody who is a chronic heavy user that has developed alcohol dependence. Alcohol withdrawal symptoms can be life-threatening due to increases in blood pressure. Regardless of somebody's blood pressure, a lot of people experience headache, clammy skin, rapid heart rate, that's that glutamate doing its job, difficulty thinking clearly or concentrating because glutamate and the fight or flight response is active, so we're not using our wise mind, anxiety or irritability, changes in sleep patterns, fatigue, seizures, and hallucinations. In terms of alcohol dependence medications, camprosate or a camprosate or camprol is a medication that is only approved for uh, alcohol addiction. It helps by re rebalancing the brain chemicals affected by chronic alcohol use, particularly GABA and glutamate. Now, Trexone or Vivitrol is another medication which seems to be a lot more frequently used now to help people um, stop using. Just like with opioids, uh, now Trexone blocks the um, euphoric effects, blocks the alcohol's ability to stimulate those mu receptors. So you drink and it's like, oh, you know, whatever. Uh, and it doesn't provide the response that the person was looking for. So it's helpful. It's not going to do everything, but it can be helpful. Antabuse is the old-fashioned drug that people would take that um, a lot of people who are alcohol dependent have, I'll be honest, have found a way around and they have found ways to test it and, you know, use it, but still drink. And so antabuse in my clinical experience is less effective than Vivitrol. Um, I have seen it used together. So we're re removing the re rewarding properties of alcohol and we are adding the punishment, if you will, of potentially getting sick as a dog. There are a few other things that are not FDA approved for alcohol use disorder, but have been shown to be effective through an off-label use. Topamax and Zofran are two medications that are available that have been shown to be helpful. And then auricular vagus nerve stimulation. Remember, we did a video on that a few weeks ago. Um, stimulating that vagus nerve can help reduce the glutamatergic activity. Additionally, um, auricular, the ear, vagus nerve stimulation directly stimulates nuclei that promote GABA activation. And it's been shown to be, to help people enhance cognitive control. Well, you think if you help them get out of fight or flee so they can think for a second, it can help them manage their thoughts a little better. As we age, our liver becomes less able to remove toxins from our system. Additionally, many older adults are on medications that are also metabolized by cytochrome P450. If you're working with an older adult, and when I say older, I mean 50 and above, uh, don't wait to 65, our liver starts kind of aging um, about the same time our gonadal hormones start to, to decrease. And it's important, important to recognize that and how alcohol interacts with all your different medications. Drugs.com, if you type in drugs.com and interactions, they have a great um, website that you can put in each drug the person is on and it will tell you the known interactions. Physical impact and consequences. Physical health impact of alcohol use increases the stress response, increases dehydration, which also impairs cognition, increases fatigue, inflammation, pain. As infl systemic inflammation goes up, anywhere where you already had inflammation or pain is probably going to hurt more. Anemia, muscle wasting, 
osteoporosis. Now, obviously, that's in people who chronically use. Sleep problems, including apnea, and an increased risk of infections, including skin infections. Interpersonally, alcohol also cause problems because fatigue, pain, frequent illness, and worsening mood affect the individual's ability to maintain healthy relationships and potentially function in social or work settings. We go down to emotional and cognitive impacts. Deficiencies in B vitamins and vitamin D we know are linked to mood disorders, and alcohol prevents the absorption of a lot of these. Um, and these emotional impairments can perpetuate the cycle of alcohol abuse, may also negatively impact the person's interpersonal health, their relationships, and make it harder for them to get good quality sleep. Cognitively, sleep disruption, neurotransmitter alterations, and worsening mood impact our attention. It increases our stress, so it's going to impact our attention, concentration, perception, memory, problem solving, and learning or executive functioning. Environmentally, fatigue, illness, mood, pain issues, all of these contribute to difficulty focusing and functioning at work if you even make it there at all, which contribute to job instability, financial instability, and housing instability, which all increase stress and worsen the whole picture. In terms of long-term risk, Chronic nutritional deficiencies, especially of vitamins A, D, E, and K, as well as calcium and magnesium, contribute to long-term health risks such as liver disease, cardiovascular disorders, cancer, neurodegeneration, and bone fractures. Alcohol impacts nearly every system of the body and alters levels of most of your neuro neurotransmitters. You remember from a couple weeks ago. We generally talk about the big six, but there's over 100 neurotransmitters in our body. Chronic alcohol use can lead to HPA axis dysregulation. Alcohol use causes excitotoxicity in the brain, resulting in reductions of both white and gray matter. We create an environment that's too, too hot, if you will, and we start losing brain cells. Increases in GABA and stimulation of mu opioid receptors caused by alcohol can have dangerous additive effects when combined with benzodiazepines, barbiturates, or opioids. Alcohol also potentiates SSRIs. And inhibition of thiamine absorption can cause life-threatening condition called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which should be considered when people present with a sudden onset of cognitive symptoms, but I will also add a sudden onset of any of the physiological symptoms where they may seem like their gait is off or they're uncoordinated. If there's a sudden change in their presentation. We definitely want to consider uh, whether Wernicke-Korsakoff's might be an issue. Are there any questions? You're quite welcome, Patricia. Oh, hello, Lisa. Glad to hear that the Vivitrol has been successful for your um, patients with alcohol use issues. That's wonderful. Alrighty, well, I thank everybody for being here today. I know, again, this is not typically the most exciting topic, and there's some of it that I know I got kind of down into the weeds, but you expect that from me by now. Um, if you have any questions, always feel free to comment on the video once it's posted or email us at support at allceus.com. Everybody have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next Wednesday.